my mom was just amazing in the process. You know, that was my superhero. She literally uh, saved my life when I was uh, 12. Huh. And it was crazy. It was like something out of a movie where I was a part of it. Well, not a part of, but me and her were potential hostages in a, in a, a heist at her job that she worked at. This is Knocking Doors Down, your host Jason Lachance here, and through my addiction recovery and struggles with mental health, include anxiety and depression, I've uh, realized I've had a passion of speaking with those who have turned their darkest times into their greatest advantages, and my guest, Quentin Aaron, he is no different. His new song, Lead With Love, is beautiful, and if you know that name, you might remember a, a movie called The Blind Side. He played Michael Orr in that film alongside Sandra Bullock. I mean, I've seen you in Law and Order Special Victims Unit. I'm trying to think of all the uh, NBC's Mercy, One Tree Hill, Drop Dead, and you're doing beautiful work with your foundation to advocate uh, the fight against uh, bullying, which is uh, near near and dear to my heart. So it's a real pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't. Well, so we don't have the Quentin Aaron Foundation up and running anymore, but mm. I still do. I, I still am very vocal in speaking with kids about the issues of bullying because I believe in, you know, the cause of helping kids deal with and process, you know, things that they've been going through in the past, you know, and how to get over it. Absolutely. You know? Quentin, a place I like to start, um, you know, it's the daily practice for me is gratitude. So I like asking people th uh, three things you're grateful for today. Uh, three things I'm grateful for. Um, well, I can sum that up. Life, health, and strength. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things I always thank God for is waking me up to see another day, you know, clothing my right mind with, you know, my health and strength and, you know, getting stronger every day. I've been facing a lot of medical issues over the past few years. Um, I've been diagnosed with congestive heart failure in 2019, and um, I also have type 2 diabetes. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been through the weekend stages of where, I, you know, just some days didn't have any energy to do anything. I've hurt all over, had low fatigue and everything, and I'm doing better. My heart's stronger. My uh, diabetes is getting under control. Um, and so I feel... You know, so life, health, and strength is the three things I can think of off the top that comes to mind and be grateful for. Absolutely. And, and you brought up your, your your sense of faith there. And I know that's something I've dug a lot more into um, myself. Uh, didn't really grow up with it, although ironically baptized Catholic, but didn't, <laughs> didn't come back to it until in my mid-40s. Uh, was... was like a presence of faith always there in your home growing up? Uh, yes. Yes. I grew up in the church. I uh, started singing in the choirs like when I was nine. I went and spent the summer in Augusta, Georgia with my grandparents. And my my grandma was like, you stay under this roof. You're going to go to church. And so, I, you know, I was like, OK, all right. Um, I went to church, you know, at nine years old. I'm like, let me see what I like about this place to keep coming <laughs> and then it, for me it was the choir and so I wound up joining the choir and singing with them and I my love for music was you know what first got me into wanting to go to church and then over the years it just my love for God just kind of grew and shaped who I was and who I'd become and you know it's how I lead my life through love yeah uh, you bring up Augusta, Georgia, it brought back a lot of memories. One of my good friends, Karif Bird, I met through playing basketball, traveling basketball, and he lived down there in Augusta, Georgia. And I'll tell you, some of the most beautiful people, the best mac and cheese I ever had in my life, <laughs> <laughs> and just the nicest, nicest people. It was just like, a, you know, just such a wonderful – and seeing James Brown childhood home, that was pretty cool. As exactly. Someone's a big fan of soul music. That was great. Well, Absolutely. I, and that's it. Thank you for talking about that, too, because when I heard lead with love, I was like, boy, you have such a beautiful it. You know, I felt gospel. I felt Luther Vandross like in there <laughs> and all this beautiful stuff. What what made you now want to put put this song out? Thank you. Um, I think 
So music has always been a love of mine. It's always been a direction that I figured I'd tap into in my life at some point in time, but I didn't want to start off the back with it because um, there's a lot of things about the industry that I, that I, I really, you know, I mean, it's, it's some things are for you. Some things aren't for you. Um, I've always had a love for music, not so much the, the, the business mm. side of it. I don't, I'm not familiar with the business side of it. So I, I, I wanted music to remain a passion. And, you know, some things, if you enjoy doing it, but then it becomes work, you kind of lose the excitement. So I, I never wanted to feel that way about music. So I kind of chased acting as my career and because I loved it just as much. But I, I said I'd much rather chase a career in acting and then later on do music when it makes sense. And so that's I'm at that point in my life where now it makes sense. And um, I think the mindset was if I'm going to do it, let's do it in a way where I can affect change positively throughout my fan base and people who hear my music. I want to, I want to, you know, make the world a better place if I can by encouraging and inspiring uh, people to do better in life. Uh, it's a beautiful song. And I'm going to, I'm going to put the link in the description here so people can connect, find it, get it. I, I just, uh, I was blown away, you know, and it wasn't a situation <laughs> like, like I was expecting some like, Okay, and I, you know, gentleman that's an actor, you know, is just like I'm coming into it open minded, and and I love just the title in itself, and I was like, wow! I texted it to my girlfriend, and she was like, wow! I can't believe that that is such a beautiful song. So, uh, is there plans to put some more material out uh, after the song kind of gains some traction? Absolutely, we we've been in the studio working on on this other project as well. Um, we are putting together a tour, uh, which is going to take place in August, going up the East Coast uh, from Idalia, Georgia, through Savannah, all the way up to New York. Um, and it's happening around my birthday, too. So my birthday is August 15th. We'll be in Charleston, South Carolina on that day, which is cool. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, we're doing that. I have a couple other songs that I've recorded so far. Um and we're just working on more. We're we're putting together a whole album. So nice. It's yeah. it's gonna be cool. The album won't be out for a while though. It'll probably be out like two years down the road. It's gonna it's gonna take a lot of work and creative juices flowing and everything to do it. It's my first album, so I wanna do it right. You know what I mean? I wanna I wanna make sure that I take my time with it and uh I I respect the art yeah. of recording artists and musicians and you know after being in the thick of it and seeing how so much goes into the process of just one song you know um i, I give them much kudos to to what they do producers singers songwriters everything and uh i'm just in, i'm just overwhelmed to be a part of it in that world now so i'm excited for the journey you know well, and, and you know, and I when I was listening to it, and I really I'm glad you bring up the production side. Uh, please give those who worked with you on this kudos because I, I was in a discussion. I'm like, man, people don't put songs together like a Quincy Jones did, and you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's just as far as what we're hearing with popular music. So it was really refreshing for me as someone. You know, they say when you get older, you like to listen to the same stuff. And I'm not one of those guys. I'm always looking for new, beautiful music. And and it was nice to get something. It felt very refreshing, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's a beautiful gift, too, when you can get something that, that is authentic and genuine and you're not... you're not chasing the charts, so to speak, or sounding like the same thing. And, um, yeah, it's really beautifully done. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't... I don't um I don't really know if my style is to follow trends. I, I really feel like I'm a, a trendsetter. You know what I mean? Um I I go where I'm needed, not where I feel that it'll be popular to do this and popular to do that. You know, popularity comes based on if the right people like. It. You know what I mean? Not everybody has to like me, but if the right people do, I'm winning. You know, because I could I could affect positive change in, in in just one person you know that person can go on to do better things 
and it creates a chain reaction of love and, and that's what I hope to do you know so I'm not really trying to you know if I if I make it to the top of the charts that's awesome I appreciate it I welcome it but am I disappointed if it doesn't no I just want to make an impact I want to I want people to love me for me and see my message and get involved and be encouraged or uplifted by it and and want to do more great things in their lives because of it. That's yeah. my purpose with the music anyway. I and Leap with Love is just the start of that. You know? I, I love it. Well, speaking of, of impact, um, you know, you've done a lot in the space of uh, anti-bullying, and I was kind of sharing some of my story of childhood prior to us getting on, but, uh, you know, what What did you face growing up? You know, where did you grow up? What was home life like? And, and really, where did the bullying come into play for you? Um, I grew up in the Bronx, you know, uh, you know, in a single parent home, my mother, God rest her soul, Laura, uh, she raised me and my brother, Jared, who was like four years younger than me. Um, it was pretty good. We had our tough times and everything like most people do, but I, God was always present. He was always a part of our journey. So, you know, we had help along the way and, you know, we, we got other family. We have extended family, like you know, my aunts, uncles, cousins, my grandparents at the time. Um, it was just a lot of people, like friends, who were somewhere along the way, just helping us out to, you know, get to where we needed. We faced a lot of obstacles, but we got over them as a family. My mom was just amazing in the process. You know, that was my superhero. She literally uh, saved my life when I was uh, 12 huh. and it was crazy. It was like something out of a movie where I was a part of it. Well, not a part of, but me and her were potential hostages in a, in a, a heist at her job that she worked at. It was an insurance company where they cashed the checks in the back for the employees. And it got robbed one day while we were going to pick up her check. And they, the guys that robbed it wanted to take me as their hostage to get away. And my mom got in between the gunman and me and was like over my dead body and like literally fussed him down until he left. And he left and ran out the building, got into a shootout with the cops. And neither of the gunmen survived. If I was with them, I would have been, you know, because when I was 12, I was six feet tall. So I look, I didn't look like a kid. I looked like an adult. So if I, if I had went with them, I would have been done down right there. So that's what I mean when I said my mom saved my life when I was 12, you know? Wow. She was, yeah. While you're checking knocking doors down out, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you get a lot out of this podcast, share with a friend. And don't forget the archive of interviews we have. Bam Margera, Brandon Novak, Kat Von D, Charlie Sheen, Edward Furlong, Kelly Osborne. The list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives. Speaking of purpose, how about a lifestyle brand with purpose? 5150 LTM. That's right. Not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life, but they give back to the community. And you, the listener of Knocking Doors Down, get 20% off every time you shop at 5150 LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. There are three amazing programs, the race to end the stigma, the race for autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. Process that. I mean, you know, times I know are different and, you know, we talk a lot more about mental health, but what, what kind of a lasting impact did that imprint on you, your mom and... You, you know, it's funny, it's um, around the time I grew up, I was real into action movies and everything. So I was excited in the whole process. I was like, everything was going on. I still remember that day, play by play in my head. And I wasn't scared until my mom jumped up in between me and the gunman because I know my mom and she was not going to back down. This dude had a, a 12 gauge double barrel shotgun in her face. And he was like, 
move while I blow your brains out. She said, do what you got to do. She looked down the barrel, do what you got to do, but you're not taking my son out here with me breathing. And I'm like, mom, let me, let me go with him. Let me go. She gave me one of those. Mom, shut, your, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I'm behind her. I'm about to let you go. Shut, shut up. <laughs> like, bah, just hit me. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, man, it was, uh, I think I was young enough. I was at that age to where it didn't really hit me, the severity of it. Mm-hmm. You know, even when the guys got killed, you know, outside of it, because we heard the shots inside the building. We heard, you know, we heard it, but, you know, it didn't really affect me the, the way most people were affected by it. I wasn't traumatized. I just, it just was, yeah, it was a Tuesday or a Friday, you mm-hmm. know, for me. And I think that was the beauty of, you know, adolescence sure. at that time. You know, I, I, I don't believe there was any trauma from it because my mom had me, you know, and, and God, you know, he wasn't going to let anything happen. You know, I believe that. So, but it's just one of those stories you never forget, Yeah, you know? It's it's weird how things just do our psyches, how some things can affect situations different. And I mean, like you presented there, it's really interesting. You know, had mom not, you know, intervened and done what moms do. I mean, I could just picture mm-hmm. your, your mom, you six feet tall, because I'm six two. My mom's five feet, five foot one, you know, and I could just see. Oh, my mom was five ten. Yeah. <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she was yeah, she was she was ready to brawl. She was ready to throw down. Like uh, her thing was, you know, nobody touched my babies. Yeah. She's like, I bought them in as well. Ain't nobody gonna touch them. You know, so that was her, you know, she was mama bear for real. Oh man. Uh I wish I could have met her. She sounded like an absolutely extraordinary woman. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh so but we did talk too about about you going through through bullying. What I mean, was it because there was some, I mean, you're growing up in the Bronx. This is what, the late 80s, early mm-hmm. 90s? This is this was the 90s, yeah. This was like early 90s and stuff. Because I, I think I graduated elementary school in 95. Okay. 90, yeah, so this is like early, early 90s. Yeah, so this was some tough, this, this is Bronx, some tough times in the Bronx then. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It was. It was crazy, man. It was like and living in the thick of it. Like I mean, my school was in a movie once. It was uh it was a movie called I Like It Like That. Um I forget the the guy. He was uh he was on Chicago P D. He was on uh he was on Selena, he was Selena's boyfriend, the one that wound up marrying him. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. His name, but I yeah, know. he it was a he did a movie called I Like It Like That and in the movie they had my school in the scene. I'm like, wait, that's why I go to school that's up the street. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> but but um yeah, that was a it was a pretty cool time and I look back, I'm like, there were so many great things that we experienced at the same time, so many not so great things. So you know. Yeah, John Seda, I looked it up. That's the actor. John Seda, yes, yes. Well, how did your mom, I mean, it sounds, you know, I mean, boy, just being a single parent uh, is 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 tough. Um, how did yeah. your how did your mom kind of com- combat it, help you work with it when people maybe bullied you, you came home? I mean, through your acting, we've yeah. seen, you know, you've done a variety of roles, but, you know, when you stepped into a... a uh, being, you know, in the blind side, I mean, just your your sensitivity and vulnerability you brought to the screen seems so genuine and authentic. And now talking to you, I just imagine, you know, those kind of things. I know for me, pretty sensitive guy, you know, the bullying really yeah. hurt me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it did, it did hurt. And I remember one day in particular, um, I came home and I was sad. And I said to my mom, um, First, she came and she asked me what was wrong. And I said, how come nobody likes me? And she goes, well, let me ask you a question first. Do you believe me when I say I love you? And I said, yes. And she said, and your family, you believe they love you? I said, yeah. She said, you got some friends? I said, yeah. She goes, Do you, what about them? You think they like you? you love me? I said, yeah. yeah. And so she looks around and she's like, 
Well, what do you mean when you say, how come nobody likes you? Because I just pointed out several people in your life that love you, who's going to be there throughout your life. And the people at school that you're talking about, you don't communicate with them when you're not in school. And she was like, it doesn't, you, you weren't put here. That's when she told me, you weren't put here on this earth to please everybody or to make everybody like you. That's not your purpose. She said, you go through life, you do what you do, you do what you feel passionate about in your heart, and the right people will like you. The right people will love you. It's not your job to make everyone do that because no matter what, people are going to feel how they're going to feel. And sometimes they may not like you, but you can't control that. And I said, okay. And that was just like, it was one of those things where it was like, that was it. It was like, ever since then, I didn't care what people thought about me. It's like, I'm going I'm to be who I'm comfortable with being. I'm going to be who I am because I am a good person. And I accept that about myself and I believe that about myself. So if someone didn't like me, that just mean I didn't need to interact with them. Mm-hmm. You know, so that was like my compass. Like, I am who I'm going to be unapologetically. If you don't like me, that's cool. You go that way, I'll go this way. You know, that was that was the way I operated. How did you then in turn, when you started doing uh, advocacy work and working with the youth when it came to anti-bullying, did you communicate that your experiences with them? And I mean, yeah. because there are so many situations and like I was sharing with you, where sometimes the toughness is in the home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that was, that was the thing too. It's so many kids that are dealing with issues of being bullied in school Normally, sometimes it's the kids that are doing the bullying that are the ones that have it hard at home, you know, and, and that's why a lot of times my my talks were just as much for them as it was for the kids that were the victims of them in school, the victims of the bullies in school, because um, I went to the school one time. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it was in Georgia. And there was this kid there. Everyone called Big Mike. There's, they gave him the nickname Big Mike. Because they said he was like, um, he was uh, the biggest kid in the school and everything, but he wore like baggy clothes, like dirty clothes or whatever. Only thing was he was mean. He bullied everyone. And so I went and spoke at the school and I, I seen him there. It was like in the cafeteria. I was speaking at the cafeteria and he was there. He wasn't paying attention. or So that's what it looked like. He was doing everything but listening. And so after I finished the talk, they had this room in the back of the cafeteria where it's like a game room. And if kids are good, they can go and play games during the lunch period. And so we went in there and they had an Xbox set up. And I told the the teacher that I wanted to speak with him, with Big Mike. And so they brought him. So we're in there playing Madden. And um, I just, you know, to start it off, I'm like, yeah. So they told some of the people told me that you was the truth at this game. And, you know, and all that. <laughs> I, was like, I just wanted to see what your skills is like. So we're playing man and we're talking. And I can see throughout, he's looking at me like, like he's trying to figure me out. He's looking like, what are you doing? Like he's going to guess me. So while we're playing, I just start talking to him about me. And he was waiting for me to start telling him about what he needs to do better. I didn't do that. I said, told him a story about what I went through in, in, in school growing up. And we're playing a game and the whole time he's listening to me. He's waiting for me to tell him about himself. But what I did was I told him the story about me and how I dealt with kids that were just like him without saying that. So he got it. At the end, the kid was smart. At the end of the game, I beat him. And then when it was over, he goes, man, I appreciate what you just did. And I said, you lost. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) And he goes, he goes, you know, when you were here talking earlier, I wasn't paying attention to you because I felt like you were getting paid to be here. You didn't want to be here. He said, but you didn't have to do this. You didn't have to come and play this game with me and spend time with me and talk to me and tell me about your story and how you dealt with kids that were just like me. And I was like, I didn't say any of that to him. He said that to me. So he knew what I was doing. And then I said, man, it's crazy. I said, it's, I said, uh, 
uh, I was stumped, and then I said, uh, "Wow, so what? So what do you think about what I just said?" And he said, "I, I, if you are for real about what you said, when you're gonna come back to the school, I want to make a promise to you that I'm gonna do better." And I was like, "Okay, all right. So tell me, what does that look like?" And he goes, "I'm, a, I'm gonna do better in my grades, and I'm gonna try and go to college." And I said, "All right, cool. So you're in the ninth grade now." I'm gonna come back in probably the next two years so that I can see what it looks like, right? So I did, I kept my word. Two years later, I was starting my tour for my anti-bullying foundation at the time, this was 2013. I go back to that school and it was in Atlanta. And I go back to that school and I walk into the school and I shake this guy's hand who looks like a teacher or a principal there. And I asked him, could he point me to the office? Because it was a couple, it was a while and I hadn't remembered. So he pointed me to the office. I went into the office. The teacher, the principals, they all come around. Did you see Big Mike? Oh my God. Did you see him? And I said, no, 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 I'm here to see him. Where's he at? This, he was just in the hallway. You just shook his hand. The dude who I shook his <laughs> hand, that was him. I thought that was a principal. I swear he had a nice haircut, no gold tooth. He had the, like, he was dressed like, like from the nines. He had like khaki pants on, a nice shoe, a dress shirt, buck tucked in and everything. I went back out. I went back out to the hallway and he was standing and he was like, I could tell you didn't recognize me. I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh. I felt like a proud father, man. I was like crying. I was like, oh, God. Give him a big hug in the hallway. And, uh, he went from being, um, a straight F student to a straight A student in his right grade. He was in the 11th grade. Um, and in the 11th grade, he had 111 different college, college scholarship offers, full ride scholarship offers to play football. Wow. I was like, oh my God. Like, I felt, oh man, I felt like, I felt so proud at that moment. And that was the, the fire that ignited in me to say, I need to keep doing this. Yeah. I need to keep doing this because if I can have that big of an impact on somebody's life who is doing the opposite of what they're now doing, I don't want to stop there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yes. I absolutely know what you mean. When I've gotten messages from, from someone that, you know, a conversation that I've had with someone here on the podcast or when I speak at a high school, I usually just do classrooms only so I can get kind of the conversations and somebody writes you a letter or a direct message or an email or whatever. It's, you know, you start to feel good that you're you're serving a purpose. And I'm a person of faith, too, that, that OK, um, I, I'm doing what you <laughs> want me to do and letting you work through me. You start to like like the way you see yourself too just change, you know. And and the other great what you're sharing and thank you so much for that. That's so beautiful. Is that people can change, you know, or people, yeah. you know, the pessimistic people. Nobody ever changes. It's like no, no, exactly. no, no. You don't change, but people can change. Absolutely, people can change, and and sometimes they, they, you just got to get to that point where you want to change. And you, you are willing to submit to God. You know what I mean? And that's what it takes. It's like he can help us walk through any door that we want to walk through. But we have to instill our faith into him and know that we're not in control. He is. You know, and that's where the true change can begin to happen. And, you know, I, sometimes I can't talk about that in school because, you know, I'm supposed to talk about him, God in school. You know? Yeah, I mean, he's a part of my story, so I still I nudge it in there when I can. But you know, yeah, it's just you know, without preaching, it's just you know, testifying, you know, how he's played a part in my life, and you know, I I, I never shy away from him and or shy away from talking about him. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. I always sneak the word like faith in there or higher power or something. And it seems to, you know, circumvent the, the, the teacher that's kind of probably not totally paying attention anyway. So, exactly. you yeah. know, it's like, all right, that worked out pretty good. Uh, well, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about, you know, you playing Michael Orr and the blind side and really how that kind of changed your life as a as a young man, you know, going into acting. Oh man, it was uh, actually the gift that keeps on giving, you know, in a sense that we're 14 years later, I'm still getting love from that movie, um, even nice residual checks. So uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> doesn't that, keeps on giving. that doesn't that doesn't hurt. Exactly. So, I mean, it's honestly, that movie was such a blessing to my life because it came at a point where I was at the bottom. You know, six months prior to getting the yes for the role, me and my younger brother had lost our mom. And we were still living in the same apartment. She died. Um, I couldn't get a job to save my life. I couldn't. Nobody would hire me. And for several months throughout the winter of 2008, which was the coldest, darkest winter that we faced, man, it was a... Uh, we lost all of our electricity. Just hold it because it keeps falling. Sorry. We lost our electricity and um, all of our u utilities and all of that. And I was going back and forth to court trying to keep the place as long as I could. And so late February, I got a job, first job all winter, um, where I was doing security. It was a seven-day gig for this commercial. It was filmed at Silver Cup Studios. And um, on the last day of the commercial, I seen Tina Fey walking down the hall towards me. But before she came out, I got a call about, um, I got a call from the Sheriff's Department and they said that your this was the eviction call. You know, in 72 hours, your place is gonna be padlocked. And anything that's still in the apartment, it's going to be property of the owners. So I was like, all right, cool. I hung up. As soon as I hang up the phone and I'm standing in, on my post, Tina Fey starts walking towards me. And she's coming out and I'm like, oh, my God, that's Tina Fey. And then um, because 30 Rock was shooting like down the hall. And then um, the phone rings again and I answer. And it's my manager at the time. And she goes, Quentin, guess what? And I say, uh, the blind side. And it had been a year and some change since I heard anything about that movie. But it, it was the first thing that popped in my head when she said, guess what? I said, the blind side. She goes, how did you know? I said, wait, what? <laughs> and I, I screamed, like, what? Uh -huh. And as I did it, Tina Fey's like right there. And I said, close. And, then, and I said, okay, I'm going to call you back. I'm calling you back. So I hang up on my manager and Tina Fey's like, what happened? And so I said, uh, I just booked the lead role in a major motion picture. And she goes, wow, congratulations. Wait, I thought you were security. I said, well, I was security, but now I'm an actor. <laughs> and so I was like, <laughs> you know, and she said, well, congratulations. And she went on about her business. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, I got to call her back. I got to call her back. Because my manager didn't tell me any of that. She just said, how would you know? And I assumed everything else, right? right. But I call her back, and she's like, Hey, yeah. So, uh, I just spoke to the, you know, producer from the movie and apparently they're getting ready to start, you know, getting pre-production for the movie and they want to know if you still want to do the film. I said, I hope you told them yes. <laughs> and she said, yeah, yeah, they got, they're getting ready to call you. So I hung up the phone and the phone rang again and it was Tim Bourne, who was the uh, line producer for the movie. And he calls. And he said, yeah, yeah, we want to get you down to Georgia as soon as possible. And I said, define as soon as possible. And he goes, we'll get you down in the next couple of days. I said, I can come tomorrow. <laughs> and then he goes, absolutely. We'll get you down there. First class ticket tomorrow to Atlanta, Georgia. And I said, okay, um, can I bring my brother? Because I kind of have no place to leave him. And he goes, absolutely. We'll get you two first class tickets tomorrow. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Hung up the phone, man. I went home and told my brother. And this was the first time I seen any type of emotion on his face since her mom had passed. And it was just, oh, I was like Sandra Bullock in that scene where she walks out of the room after I told her I never had a bed before. And she went into the other room and started crying. 
Yeah. That was me in real life, literally living out that moment when I told my brother, we got the movie and we're getting ready to go to Atlanta. And he just falls back on the bed and goes like, oh my God, thank you. And he's like laughing and I'm like, oh. I, I couldn't. I was like, oh my God. Like I, I, I walked out of the room, literally walked into the other room and it was falling like, like wolf tears, like, ah, uh, you know, and um, that was the moment that changed our lives wow. forever. And 14 years later, we're still, still living our dreams, you know, or I'm still living my dream. You know, my brother's working on his music. He's doing, doing what he does. And he's, uh, we're good. You know, we're good. You know, God is still moving. God is still on the throne. He's still making the impossible happen every day. And so um, I've learned to keep my faith in him and to trust him. You know? Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. That got me. Mm. No, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't apologize, <laughs> please. Those are Those are the kind of things I love to hear now, you know, that I embrace. And it's like you know that there that that master plan so to speak that you just you just don't know it's like if you keep doing the next right thing you know that's one of yeah. like our our recovery sayings or you know when i talk to young people just keep doing the next right thing it's like you don't know what's going to transpire you don't know Absolutely. the blessings that are going to come you know if you're working for the blessings you're going to miss the mark but if you just do the next right thing and let yourself be led good things come you know, good things mm -hmm. come, you know, and right on time. And, and here, Kate, right, on, right time. on time. Absolutely. Right on time. Yeah. Uh, so what was the experience though? Like, I mean, you're working with, you know, Sandra Bullock, phenomenal actress. One of, one of my favorites for sure. After I saw her in, uh, uh, demolition, man, I was like, okay. The, the, oh yeah. This guy was awesome here. And I'm a big action exactly. fan. Like you, when I went to film school, I ended up in San Francisco state and everybody's doing their, we had to do presentations on, on either an actor or producer or director. And I did mine on Stallone and the impact on America. Whereas all mm. these other people in the class are like, Oh my God, you know, action movie fan, you know, they wanted to do documentaries and serious films. And my, my professor, Alan Kovac pulled me aside and he goes, that was one of the most brilliant papers I have read wow. in about a decade. <laughs> You know, um, yeah. And I was like, all right, see, you know, I got a lot out of this. I, you know, primarily focusing on first blood and, you know, the, the kind of mm -hmm. impact of the Rambo character, especially, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of vets and Vietnam vets and volunteer work. I've, I've somehow gotten into conversations and they're like, Rambo made us feel like we won, you know, that we didn't yeah. go and, and lose our friends for, for nothing, you know? And it was like, exactly. Wow. You know, I was able to pull that experience and, and share that. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a beautiful thing when we, we start to think about the fact that um, film, cinema itself is meant to entertain, but the entertainment can also be impactful because it comes from a real place. Mm -hmm. Even though the movie is make-believe, it comes from a place of genuine experience. You know, the stories can be told a different way, but it doesn't mean it never happened unless you're going into something that's set in the future and there's, you know, androids running the world and this and the other. That's make believe, but that's a fantasized uh, reality or, or fantasized sense of entertainment as well. But um, I was telling someone the other day, entertainers are, are charitable people. Because they use a gift that they've been given in hopes of inspiring others or encouraging others or entertaining others. That's, that's when you use something that you've been blessed with for the purpose of giving to others. It's a charitable effort. That's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you have a passion to do that, it's, it's so important and impactful that we do. Because this world needs, uh, sorry, this, uh, somebody tried to call. I thought I had on do not disturb. Um, this world needs, um, inspiration. Yeah. We need positivity. You know, we need to be 
we need to be like impacted with good because there's so much hate out there and it's taking over. And my job, I feel, is to spread love the best way that I can. I want to just do my part, you know, to put good out there into the world. And if I can use the art, something that I'm passionate about to do it, you know, that's what I'm going to do. Did uh did Mr. Orr, Michael Orr, what what was what was his take when the film was finished in your portrayal of him and I know there's been articles that came out ever since, but I'm not I don't really feel that it's my uh I'm not speaking for them at mm. all because there's articles that's been out, but I I can only go with what I know personally and neither he nor the family were pleased with the finished product of the movie. Oh, I didn't know that. You know, yeah, but it's, uh, I mean, there's nothing that's, that I can control. I was just the actor. I wasn't, you know, the producer or the writer or anything. Um, but I've seen how there's several articles that came out over the years where they talked about, you know, what really happened and how the blind side gives a false reality to the story and, but you know, that's the politics of Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's unfortunate they didn't like it. I mean, it's only the highest grossing sports film of all time, but somebody somewhere did something right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. You know, exactly. the sto story was told pretty well. I mean, you know, got me tears in a minute. Like the the thing where you, you know the scene where you talk about in the movie where you deliver the line. I've never had a you know a bed to sleep on. I was like, oh my, you know, because yeah, it, it just reminds you like to to count your blessings and back to where we started with gratitude is like remembering that that is going on um you know my my partner she's never seen the show breaking bad and we started watching it and in the episode we watched last night this poor little kid is growing up in the home of two parents addicted he's covered in filth and sleeping on a mattress on the floor and you you know it, it takes mm -hmm. it, for me when i see that i know that is based on reality and so i step back into gratitude where i'll take my struggles over somebody else's you know, hey, money's a little bit tight. Maybe we had to cut back on the groceries or don't get to do some outing this month. You know what? I'm blessed. I have a good roof over my head. You know, I'm a lucky man. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, Quentin, this is where I jump into a little bit of fun, random questions. You want to have these are just for laughs. Let's all right. Do it. All right. Do uh, it. Pet peeves. Things that just annoy you. Oh, um. There's so many. <laughs> All right. Uh, first, I don't. I don't like lying. Like I don't. I mean, I don't like to be called a liar because I don't lie. Right. Yeah. So if, if if someone, you know, continuously calls me a liar about things that I know I'm telling the truth about, that's a big pet peeve. It, it, it pisses me off. <laughs> you know. Uh, that's one of them. Um, I hate to be lied to. You know. That's another one. Um, uh, when I think I think when people don't listen, you know, when I when I say something that I mean, but you take it for playing, or you you speak over me and don't listen to me, and then do the things that I constantly told you not to do. And I, uh, when I told you before, it was a warning. But you didn't pay attention. Now you're still doing it. Now I'm starting to get a little teed up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so those are some of my big ones. And disrespect. Yeah. Well, when you talk about those things, that, that you know, as a parent myself, that like, oh, yeah, those things with the kids, when you get that stuff, it's like, just, just tell me straight. You know your dad's understanding. I'm not a go-off-the-handle kind of person. You know, we could talk exactly. this through pretty smoothly. Uh, yeah. You're stranded on a deserted island. You have one music artist's greatest hits and one movie with you. What are they? One music artist's greatest hits. One movie. Uh, my favorite artist to listen to in the day is uh, Music Soul Child, but um, no, Michael Jackson. 
I, I got a great uh, playlist of all my favorite Michael songs and, you know, looping back to, uh, you know, Quincy Jones. And it's just like you listen to some of those those early albums. It's just the brilliance of the production and just exactly. You're like, oh, yeah. man, Quincy knew where to place a, a, a rock guitar part and he knew where some strings needed to go and additional percussion. And it's just like they're masterpieces. It's just beautiful. Exactly. And then a uh, movie. Oof, I wanted to turn it out. I got the music and then the movie. This is going to go off the cuff. One Fine Day, George Clooney and Michelle Pfeiffer. Okay, that's pulling it something out that I've not heard in a long time. Why? That was one of my favorite movies uh, for a long time. I'm a hopeless romantic. You know what I mean? I love love stories. I love rom times and stuff like that. And the song in the movie, One Fine Day itself, is, is like, it puts you in that mindset, in that mode that you really want to experience that day. Yeah. And so if I was stuck on a deserted island and that one movie, I'd probably play it over and over again for the song as well as the movie. I like the movie. But like, you know, that, that One Fine Day, I think Natalie Merchant was the artist that sung it. Um, yeah. That'll probably be it. <laughs> if uh, you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, that is a good one. I mean, I don't want to live forever, so I won't say invulnerability. Um, teleportation. Right. That would probably be a good thing. If I could teleport anywhere anytime you know what I mean yeah. you, know, you can get teleport anywhere from like you know rather it's you know 2023 or 1984 to you know what I mean to <laughs> anywhere time past present future and uh or even just locally just like I, if I need to be across the town in a blink of an eye I'm across the town <laughs> Well, think about I mean, it th this way too, Quentin. You get a ditch TSA. You don't have to stand in that exactly. line, take off exactly. the shoes anymore. Exactly. Uh, like you late for your flight? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, doors about to close. I'll be there in a second. <laughs> you know. Oh uh, yeah, that is a uh, that is definitely one of those that that uh, that I could see wanting to employ. That would be a beautiful superpower. Um, exactly. It, if you could play any fictional role, either based on a person, uh, what you've already done, uh, and, and brilliantly, um, or that hasn't been done, uh, who who would you want to play? Is there any particular role, character, superhero, historical figure, anyone? Oh, yeah. Um, I really still feel like um, there is a superhero out there in the Marvel Universe that I, that I fit. That Marvel just needs to talk before. So just gonna put that out there. And Marvel, I need y'all to find that find that superhero story to tell about somebody who's like me. Like I mean, I could be the, the cinematic version of Luke Cage. I'm just saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, or somebody else. I mean, I'm only I'm six foot eight powerhouse. I could be Luke Cage. You know. Yeah. I have the size of a massive, you know, figure who could do great things with action movies. I could I could face the rock. You know what I mean? So, but um uh let's see. I mean I've heard people say that I would be great as um in the Barry White film. Like if they did a bar a bio white a bio film with Barry White, that I would be good with Barry White. If I had the size, I would have loved to have done the George Norman film. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know? I I haven't watched it yet, but George Foreman was one of my more favorite boxers. He's he's behind uh, uh, Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard, and Sugar Ray Leonard more of a personal one. And hopefully, I'm going to get a talk to him because he was open about going through molestation in his youth and through his recovery. Mm. And it was like, whoo! I've got to meet this man after hearing that. Is like, look, if that guy he can do what he did in life and be that vulnerable. So can I, absolutely. you know, Is that absolutely. oh, I could see the Barry White, though, and you could do it on the level of like <laughs> what Gary Busey did for Buddy Holly, where you could actually be oh, singing yeah. the songs and oh, oh yeah. yeah, or Ray. Oh, my gosh, you could. Yeah. Oh, man. 
We need Jamie, to make that happen. Jamie Foxx embodied Ray. Like, yeah. oh my God. Like, you didn't see Jamie Foxx when he did that movie. You thought that was Ray Charles. Like, oh, that's yeah. how great he was. You know, that off the thing you thought, but you know, yeah, that's what that's pretty dope. Yeah. When I spoke to to Gary Busey on this podcast, I told him that as a kid that I'm sitting, me and my mom loved that music and, you know, I'm sitting there and, and thinking that I'm watching Buddy Holly, you know, and the Buddy Holly story. And he was blown away. He's like, wow, that's the best compliment I've ever got. I thought I was like, mom, didn't Buddy Holly die? How am I watching him in this movie that got made five years exactly. ago? You know, it's like, exactly. wow. Like, that's oh. not him. That's Gary. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, Quentin, I know you, that you're really busy. I like to leave the, the guest with the final thought, just anything that you would want to lend to people, uh, be it advice, just sharing from personal experience, whatever it is. Oh, man. Um, so much advice. But first and foremost, uh, for all the dreamers out there, to, to everyone who has a dream of doing something bigger than what they currently are doing, who, who uh, we only get one life to live, and there's no rule or law that prevents us from living our best life. It's just us. You know, so if you have a dream of doing anything that you feel is spectacular or amazing, and you're not doing it, stop doing what you're doing and focus on that. You know, chase that dream. My mom used to tell me all the time, chase your dreams until they become your reality or live your life working for people living their dreams. And I decided to be a dream chaser. You know, it takes that belief in yourself. And, and once you have that belief in your ability to do that thing that you desire, get the like-minded team of individuals around you that's going to encourage you, inspire you, drive you, influence you, and, 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 you know, just keep you going, motivate you, you know, because that's how you win. That's the recipe to winning in life. You have to have like-minded individuals that have a little bit of something that you don't, but all the same mindset that they want to go towards the same direction. Because if you hang with people that are doing the opposite, you don't be playing tug of war in life. Don't play tug of war in life. Go after that thing that you never thought you can do. And watch it happen. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma, to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about.